G'day, how you doing? Hopefully the microphone's coming through loud and clear. One second. I got my phones up, capturing the different scenes this morning. Two camera angles, one for when I'm working on the computer here and one for doing the intro for you guys. Hope you like the set. It's made out of cardboard. Would you believe it? Cardboard boxes back here um, with about $100 worth of Dulux rust paint painted over the top. And in my own, is it coming through loud and clear? Just give me a yes on the comments. I can see the comments here, um, but normally I have my phone up sort of um, just to make sure I can hear myself perfectly. Anyway, let me know. If you could see the rest of my studio, it looks good from this angle, but around I've got paint and brushes and cardboard bits and pieces and tools and hard drives and stuff strewn everywhere. There's hardly a fresh, you know, a clean section of the carpet available. It's a real big mess. Hope your weekend was great. I had a great weekend. Looks good. It must be coming through loud and clear. No complaints, which is good. We had a bit of fun and games on Friday with Ignacio, didn't we? A great presentation with, Ign with Ignacio on Friday. And we got that um, rather interesting audio loop going, which because of the way I had the stream set up, I couldn't hear that coming through. And you guys were um, having a good laugh, but that's what it's all about. It's all about not taking ourselves too seriously, having a go. And on that, actually... Okay, cool. Everyone's saying it looks great. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Now on that, I just wanted to bring up a little bit of a point that I often bring up in my live workshops, and that's about achieving your dreams, achieving your goals, whether it be photography or any other success you would like to achieve. And I think this is a good demonstration of that. This little show, you know, I started it without any expectations, really just to give the easy way photography students something to do, a little bit of inspiration to get creative and uh, fill in some time and it started to develop and as it's developed I've gotten more invested in it and I keep improving and hopefully I can keep improving and make a better output for the show whilst still you know maintaining who I am as an individual but what I wanted to mention you know achieving your dreams and and some would say that I've had some success in photography or or whatever it happens to be and success for me always comes the same way and, and the analogy I often give to people at my workshops is, do you think you could walk from Perth on the west coast of Australia to Sydney on the east coast of Australia? And most people kind of think, and for those in the USA, which is my second biggest audience outside of Australia, that would be roughly the same as walking from the west to the east coast of USA, okay? And most people sort of think, well, probably... Not yet, might be possible, but I'm probably not going to do it. Well, essentially, I feel that's how most successes are achieved. It's by just starting to head in that general direction where you think you want to end up and just continually taking small steps. Now, most of us, you know, we could easily, well, when we're allowed to go back outside, legit, um, we could easily walk from here you know, probably down to the shops a couple of kilometres. Now, obviously, there are those of us that, you know, that are not able-bodied, that are unable to do that, but I think you can still resonate with an, this analogy. Most of us could walk down the local shops, and if given enough time, we could walk into the next suburb, you know, and, and then the suburb after that, and, you know, months or years later of doing little steps each day, you'll eventually achieve that goal, be able to walk from one side of the state or the country to the other. Now, most of us, that's not something we want to achieve. Forrest Gump did it, didn't he? Ran from one side of the USA to the other. But that's what I want to say, you know, start heading in the general direction that you think you want to go to, to achieve whatever it happens to be. You know, the creative photography that you want to capture. Maybe you want to produce beautiful illustrative photography like Sue Ellen Cook, or maybe you want to produce that romantic, dramatic style that I showed last week. And don't get too overwhelmed by wanting to be right there right now. It's just about heading in that general direction. Yeah, you're going to take some wrong turns. You will take some wrong turns. You'll take some deviations. But if you stay focused and stay persistent and keep taking those steps, you will end up achieving whatever it is you're wanting to achieve. I really believe that, and I've used it to success in several fields before, including photography, just by keep persisting and keep improving day in, day out.
Anyway, that was a bit of a sidetrack. Speaking of Sue Ellen Cook, Facebook told me this morning, I'm not sure if she's with us here, if you are Sue Ellen, happy birthday. A big happy birthday to Sue Ellen Cook. And while I was there, I rarely look at this, but I clicked on the little Facebook notification to see if any other viewers' birthdays were today that I recognised, and there was. There was Jim Merchant, who is often with us here. Happy birthday, Jim. And also Terry Robinson, who is usually not here in the live stream, but a big shout out to you as well, mate. When you join in later, happy birthday, brother. Okay. Um, there was a couple of other things. Have a look in the description below. As always, there's a whole bunch of information down there, including my top 10 favourite streams so far. So have a look down in the description. If you've missed any of those, they're the best ones. At least I believe they're the best ones. Jump in and have a look at those. As always, there is my most popular Photoshop course down there, which is now pay whatever you like, whatever you can afford. Have a look at that, including you can have it as a gift from me for free if you're doing it a little bit tough. What else do I need to mention? What else did I need to mention? There was a couple of things. Oh, I put a link to join my email list down below as well. I give, it, I give a free photography tip once a week, plus you'll be able to keep up with everything that I'm doing as, you know, as we keep going um, with both YouTube and photography tours, etc., etc. once we reopen up. If you're a regular, I'm looking over here, I've got some notes over here. If you're a regular, thank you so much for joining us again. Be sure to hit the like button, that's all I ask, that would be absolutely incredible. Hit the like as form of I don't know, form of payment for joining me on this show this morning. In fact, hit the dislike button. It's just as good as far as YouTube is concerned, apparently. One or the other, it doesn't matter, whichever way you go. Um, two weeks left to enter the free photo competition in the, the description below. That's it. That's it. I hope you enjoy the new set. We've got another camera over here. We've got a little, oh, Sue Ellen is with us. Happy birthday, Sue Ellen. Great to have you here. I hope you have a magical day. Um, great to have you here on your birthday. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's switch scenes. Here we go. Switch scenes in three, two, one. I'm over here now. I was over there. Now I'm over here. This camera, <laughs> this one is not graded the same. It's a little bit brighter, I think, is it? I don't know. It doesn't really matter. In my new usual manner, you'll notice the intro scene. I've never done video colour grading before, and you, you might have noticed that I went for an over-dramatic, sort of dark, smoky atmosphere to that particular one. So I'll probably look back on that, as we do with a lot of our edits when we go over the top and we learn something new. I'll probably look back on that in a couple of months or, or whatnot and think, oh, what was I doing? A little bit over the top, but you know, you know what I'm like. I love over the top. Okay. Sue Ellen loving the new set. <laughs> it's been a lot of work to be honest and it's not complete yet. I would like the main camera. I'm using my a spare mobile phone and my current mobile phone as the webcams here, two feeds coming in. And I would love the main camera, the intro on set to be coming at you at a higher resolution because the 1080p, it just breaks down a bit, particularly when I start color grading. But, you know, we're just improving as we go and, um, you know, working with what we've got, essentially, working with some old cardboard boxes and minimal budget. So it's, it's coming along pretty well. Thanks, everyone, for watching along and encouraging me. I'm committing to this for at least, I think it's going to be at least another four, five, six weeks on the five days a week. And then we'll have a, have a look and reassess from there. I am going to have to get back to some sort of norma normal work or normality at some stage, but I will keep going. Um, and it's going to come down, to be honest, how successful this ends up being in the next few uh, weeks or couple of months that we do this for. If it ends up being really successful, well, I'll change my priorities around and, and turn it into um, more of this YouTube stuff and less of some of the other things, but we'll see how that goes. All right, this is the image. It's, it's a family moment captured. It's not, I wouldn't say it's in my normal style. You know, normally I'm going for dramatic and gloomy and, and romantic. And there might be some elements of uh, romanticism, I suppose, with that big, beautiful night sky there. But really, I didn't capture this for anyone else. But 
myself and the family here. This is my beautiful family, my wife, Samantha, and my little son, Lockie, there. And we're sitting around the campfire. For those of you that don't know, in 2018 and 2019, I spent the majority of both of those years traveling around Australia. I don't know, I must have done 50, 60, 70,000 kilometers or so in those, in those nearly two years, traveling around the country, teaching workshops, meeting people, taking photos. And this is one of those moments, and I had that fo this photo in mind for a long time. I often wondered whether I could capture a beautiful Australian beach scene with a beach campfire, with a couple of mates sitting around and the stars in the background because the Milky Way comes up over the east coast in Australia, so the beach would be perfect to capture this scene. I've never, never managed to get that scene to come together, but with my little family here in our little fire pit, traveling in our caravan, I just had to wait for the perfect location, and that perfect location was right here. It's called Rainbow Valley, about 100, 150 k south of Alice Springs. Absolutely spectacular. Google Rainbow Valley Northern Territory and you'll see what I'm talking about. Campground holds about, used to, back in the first time I was there, used to hold about six or eight campers. They've extended that now, it probably holds 40 or 50. But we got this incredible spot. You can kind of make out the silhouette of the, um, well, the mountain, the hill, the sandstone structure in the background there on the horizon. It faces east, the campground has this aspect which faces east, it picks up the Milky Way. I happen to be there at the perfect time when the Milky Way is rising, not too long after the sun goes down, which was around about mid-year. Um, I'm guessing June-ish, May, June, late, yeah, late May, early June, I'm guessing. In fact, We'll have a look. The date will be on the raw file in a minute when we have a look at the raw file, as well as the settings. But I set up this campfire, I was cooking some burgers, and I thought, wow, this could be the location to really capture something quite special. I thought it was probably impossible to capture a raging campfire and get that beautiful dim glow from the night sky from the one shot, but it is possible. It is possible. I tried a few different settings and I'm going to tell you which ones work so that you can try and replicate this at some stage yourself. I've replicated it again. Uh, I had some friends that met us in the Grampians uh, for Sammy's birthday actually and we replicated it again with both families sitting around the campfire. So it's possible. The one tricky thing is it's a long exposure so trying to get my little boy four years old to sit still whilst the camera was exposing was extraordinarily difficult. But let's have a look at the raw file. As I said, if you're enjoying the, enjoying the show, enjoying the stream, and you're a regular, be sure to hit the like button. Um, it's much appreciated and it tells YouTube that this is worth watching. If you're brand new, welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm Adam Williams. I always forget to tell you who I am and introduce myself each show. Sorry about that. Um, I guess it's kind of the casual nature of what we do here. But if you're new and you would like to join us, we do this every morning in this time slot, which is 10 a.m. Sydney time. Hit the, notif hit the notifications, hit the subscribe button. Also click the notifications bell and get notifications and YouTube will notify you each time we go live. But it's the same time every day, Monday to Friday, which is right now, 10 a.m. Sydney time, we go live, okay? So be sure to join us again. I'd love to have you here again. And if you are new, Say hello in the chat. I've got the chat streaming live into the feed here so I can see everyone that's uh, on there. So say g'day um, in the chat if you're new. All right. I'm not going to be able to see the chat for a second because we're going to switch back to Lightroom. And I don't have that set up, although I probably can, can't I? Oop, let me just set that up so I can see the chat whilst... Can I do that? Come here. Once again, those who are regulars will know that I often have these moments of inspiring YouTube where I'm fiddling around with uh, the technical side of things. No, not really. I try and avoid all that. But here's the raw file, okay? Here's the raw file. Let's have a quick look back at Photoshop. There's the finished. One single capture. Look, to be honest, I'm not too fussed about one single capture, and if you're a regular here, you will know that. But for those that are, there are a lot of people that would like to capture, you know, a certain authenticity 
Is that even a word? <laughs> Authentic photos is what I'm trying to say in one capture. And I completely respect that. Absolutely, I completely respect that. Um, and this particular image was captured in one shot. So for those of you that really enjoy capturing in one shot, you're going to enjoy this because I'm going to show you not only the settings, but how I process this particular image to really elevate it to, I suppose, what I had in mind. I had this beautiful vision in mind um, of a beautiful warm campfire, beautiful awe-inspiring night sky. Bring them together, bring that vision to reality. So here's the, here's the raw file and you'll see, it's a bit noisy, okay, it's going to be, but the details that are really going to matter are the, you know, the faces of myself and uh, my wife. You can see my boy shifted his head a little bit, so he's a little bit blurry, but it doesn't really matter. It's about the moment, isn't it? It's not, photography has never been about detail, you know, or at least artistic photography has never been about detail. It's about capturing moments and capturing stories. Sure, there's some technical photography, you know, mapping and this and that, which re requires detail and is all about detail. And to some extent, astrophotography can fit into that scientific realm of being all about accurate detail. But for me, not so much. It's about capturing moments and capturing stories. And I think you might agree that I probably managed to do that with the uh, uh, finished photo that we just that I just showed you. How would you like to see the settings? How do we find the settings in here? Where are they? Here they are. Here they are. Settings. You can see them up in the top corner here. This is what I shot with. I shot with a Nikon D800. Beautiful camera. Uh, captures great astrophotography because it has a really great way of handling noise, which is really important. You can capture astrophotography with pretty much any modern digital camera, but the results are going to be somewhat varied depending on how good your camera is at handling high ISO noise. The D800 was a huge leap in its day um, in technology for handling that, so it's particularly good. It's probably not as good you know, my camera's 12 years old, 11, 12 years old. It's probably not as good as the modern Nikon camera. What is it, even the late D850, I think the latest one is. That's probably even better. Um, and whatever the latest Canon is. Okay, but there are some really modern cameras as well that don't have a really good ability to handle high noise. Um, so if you're really, really interested in Astro particularly, look for a camera that can do, um, you know, handle that noise really, really well. Lenses. And look, I might do a more in-depth video online tutorial type scenario for astrophotography. Look, I'm not an astro expert, but I, but I know, you know enough um, about the lenses and the settings and the cameras and all the technical details behind it. I suppose, whilst I, I don't consider myself an astro expert, I've got a, 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 a quite a bit of built up knowledge in that area, even though I don't tend to use and capture Astro all that often. I've done a lot of it in the past. So the settings were ISO 1600. And for those of you that are used to capturing Astro, dedicated Astro photos without a blazing campfire in the foreground, you'll probably think, well, 1600 is not ideal. And you'd be right, it's not ideal for Astro photography, in my opinion. The reason for that being is generally astrophotography, if you're just capturing a landscape with a beautiful night sky without a moon, without any light source in there, other than the stars, the twinkling stars, you're generally going to want an ISO at 3200 potentially. You could get away with 1600, but you're also going to want a shutter speed of probably 20 to 30 seconds, depending on the width of your lens. And there's all sorts of intricacies as to which settings you choose, which lenses you choose, and which camera you choose. I won't go right into those now because it, it'll go into great detail and it will take us forever. But as I said, I might record all of those details and, and create a little mini astro course with lenses and settings and you know all the different things you need to talk about. If that's something you might be interested, be sure to sign up to the email list below. And uh, once that's ready, I will put an email out to that list. Lens. I use an absolutely incredibly beautiful, incredibly sharp Samyang 14mm XP. It is the 
expert. I don't know if XP stands for expert. It's the professional level lens that Sam Young makes in the 14 mil. It does, or at least when I got it, it costs about a thousand dollars Australian. Okay. So considerably less in US dollars. And I'm not sure if Sam Young, the Sam Young brand exists in the USA because it goes under a number of other brand names, Sam Young. I can't think of the other brand names. Throw it in the comments if you, um, if you know the other brand names that Sam Young goes under around the world. But the 14mm XP is incredible. It's an incredible landscape lens. It's an incredible, in my opinion, it's the best astro lens for wide angle astrophotography, wide angle landscape astrophotography. Now, there is a more budget conscious lens that Sam Young makes as well. The one I have is like an aluminium metal build. Glass is incredible. It's incredibly crisp and sharp with lots of resolution. But there's another one, a plastic build one. It is a 14 mil as well. I can't think of the exact model of that one. But if you look it up and you can find a 14 mil Samyang for about $100, $150 secondhand on eBay or brand new, probably, I don't know, roughly 200, I'd guess. I'm not exactly sure on that, 250 maybe then that will be the plastic one. It's very, very good as well. In my opinion, it, it's not as good as the one I have, the XP version. So weigh that up. If you're really dedicated to astrophotography, the XP is an excellent lens. Settings, ISO 1600, the 14 mil lens on my Nikon D800, excellent combination. I open the aperture up to as wide as it goes. That XP 14 mil goes to 2.4. Um, an aperture of 2.4, f-stop of 2.4. The great thing about this particular lens is it is excellent wide open. Now you can get a lot of lenses that will go down to f1.2, you know, or really, really low. I've got another lens which is very, very good, even wide open actually, is the Zeiss 2.0. Um, Zeiss 21mm, it's a bit of an iconic lens, but it's very, very expensive, even more expensive than the XP. But with some of the other lenses that will go down to wide apertures and, and particularly for astrophotography, generally you want a lens with fast glass or a low, able to go down to the, you know, the 1.4s or the 2.4s or the 2.8 level aperture. I don't know, this is a bit technical. Um, but you want fast glass. And the great thing about this Samyang is that it is very, very good at the fastest aperture, whereas some, are, some other lenses that are not designed for Astro, sure, you can take them down to 1.4 or 2.0, but they might sort of put some distortion or coma or something unwanted into your stars, blur your stars, or coma is when the stars turn into little angels, it looks like little tiny angels in the sky. Okay, the Samyang doesn't present most of those issues when it's wide open. It's very, very good, very, very sharp. And you'll notice I only expose for four seconds. Okay, and this is mainly to do with the fire. Anything over four seconds, you can see the fire here is slightly overexposed, but as I drop the highlights, I can probably get that back to a reasonable level. Still a bit over, yeah, but, but it's not too bad. Whereas if I left this for your traditional astrophotography at about 30, 20, 30 seconds, that glow of the fire would probably engulf that entire area and uh, completely ruin the photo. So a bit of a balance between how to just maintain the overexposure of that fire while still trying to capture some detail in the background. Hopefully that makes sense. Couple of questions. Graham says, the live is very much appreciated. I appreciate you being here too, Graham, most mornings. Thanks for joining. Uh, Jane asks, D -d 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 I tried to do an astro with a quiver of trees in Nambia, but couldn't get the tree stars both in focus. Well, you're either probably too close to the trees um, or your lens is not wide enough. Because if you're using a like a 14 mil or even a 20 mil lens, you don't have to be too far back from the trees for the trees to be in focus at infinity. Now, with that being said, this particular shot, the stars are a little bit blurry because I wanted the family, my family here, 
to be the feature and really fill the frame because that's what the story is about. And the stars are a secondary element that are helping to tell the story, but they're not the um, primary element, if you like, or the primary feature. So they're a little bit blurry. So no big deal in this photo, but if you're going for you know, a traditional landscape with pinpoint focused stars, you want a really wide lens set that to infinity and generally with a really really wide lens like a 14, a 16 or a 20 you only need to be three meters roughly back from the subject being the trees for them to be in focus and for the stars to be in focus whereas if you're using like a 50 mil or something like that it becomes much more critical you need to be further back from the trees so that they can be in focus you know, on infinity, whatever that happens to be, might be six or eight, 10 meters away, and then the stars to be in focus too. So wide lens, set the camera to infinity. The easiest way to set your camera to infinity is do it during the day. If you have a manual lens, then set it up on live view during the day and put a little white mark on your lens where infinity, perfect infinity is, where it's absolutely perfect. Or if you have an auto lens, set it to auto during the day, focus at a distant power pole or a distant mountain or a distant tree or a distant cloud. Once it focuses on that cloud or whatnot, again, mark it. And then if you're ready to go out that night, flick the lens over to uh, manual mode, manual focus. And then at night, you just need a torch to line up the mark on your lens, a little white dot on your lens, okay? And that works really, really well. The hardest thing to do is try and grab focus when it's pitch black in the middle of the night and it's all a bit blurry on the screen. It can be done, but it's very, very difficult. Easier to do it in the day. Infinity in the day should be infinity at night time um, with any luck. There was also another one. Fiona asks, have I met Ari Rex in Canberra? I haven't met Ari, but I know of his work. It's absolutely phenomenal, absolutely stunning. So if you're looking at uh, wanting to look at some incredible astro landscapes, look up Ari, um, Ari Rex. I didn't know that was his last name, but there you go, Ari Rex. Another one is um, Luke Sharkey, incredible astro landscape photographer. Look up Luke. And we have one of Australia's foremost experts on deep space astrophotography. I'm not sure if he's still there. Andy from Andy's Astro Picks. Look up Andy's Astro Picks. Absolutely incredible, award-winning deep space astrophotography. And I just messaged him this morning and uh, he said he would come on the live stream. And after this is finished, I'll contact him again and we'll get a date. Luke Sharkey is also coming on in the uh, near future. So we might have an astro week coming up where we have Luke presenting his landscape astrophotography, which is spectacular. And then a slightly different take with Andy presenting his deep space astro photography. Absolutely incredible. Hopefully that sounds good. Let me have a quick look here. Tracy said, would a two or three stop grad upside down help in this situation? Yeah, it could do. Absolutely. Hold the fire back and expose. Yeah. Did I do that? No, I don't think I, well, maybe, it, you know what? Maybe I did do that. Maybe I did do that, but that's a great idea. I can't remember now. It was a couple of years ago. I might have done that. Yeah. Uh, uh, and what we're talking about is a neutral density graduated filter, which normally is used to hold back a bright sky at sunrise or sunset and allow the foreground to expose more. So the darker part of the filter holds back the bright area. We could flip it upside down in this case to help hold the, the fire back. Um, and expose the sky a little bit, a couple of extra stops. That could work absolutely brilliantly. I can't remember, to be honest, if I did that. But if you've got neutral grad filters, you know, try it with, try it without, see what works better. Doug asks, do I use the uh, infinity focus point on the focus ring? No, not until I've tested and found out where that infinity focus point relates to the optimum infinity focus, the perfect infinity focus. So uh, you need to test your lens during the daytime because often, I mean, on my Zeiss 20 mil, for example, um, the perfect focus is all the way around to the infinity stop and then like a half millimeter tweak back, okay? And the Samyang, to be honest, I can't remember. I think the Samyang, I've got a little mark on it, a little white mark. 
I've got white marks on both in fact, but I know the Zeiss so well because I use it as my go-to landscape lens that just in the moment I just go to infinity and it goes clonk on the stop and then a hair like a oh, little half millimeter back, absolutely perfect every time, every shot. Richard Tatey, Richard Tatey, great nightscape images, YouTube channel, best tutorials I've come across anywhere until today. Until today, uh, Brian, this could be the better one. Although, you know, in, with respect um, to Richard, I haven't even got started yet. So we're going. I'm making you wait today, aren't I? We're just having a conversation, a cup of tea conversation about photography. You know, a little bit of social uh, socialising. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, anyway, we got Declan here. I also saw we had. Uh, is it Torben? From the other side of the world, it's about 2 or 3 a.m. Declan, it's in the middle of the night for you too, mate, isn't it? Um, thanks for staying up and watching. Um, I should get to it so you guys can get to bed and not have your eyes falling out of your head on Monday morning. Okay, so they're the, they're the settings for this particular shot. Have a play around, see what works, what you're aiming for, and it's much the same as any other photo, really, is you're aiming to expose for your highlight. So in this shot, I exposed for the fire. Didn't want it, I was allowing it to blow out a little bit, overexpose a little bit, but I didn't want it to go too far because it would ruin the shot. And I was just hoping that I could bring the stars back in post. Now for my astrophotography, I do most the heavy lifting in Lightroom, actually. For those of you that um, are doing my Photoshop course, link in the description. Uh, you will know that I do most of my editing in Photoshop, but for astrophotography, I actually do the majority of the edit or the heavy lifting really elevate the file in Lightroom more so than what I do with my standard landscape. So you'll see that we already pop those highlights down a little bit there. Let's do that. And this is, you wouldn't do this in a normal astro photo. This is to control the burn of that fire to get it back to a reasonable level, because in actual fact, the highlights on a normal astro photo will dim your stars, and we want bright, 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 sparkly stars, not dim stars, so you wouldn't do that, forget that on a normal shot. Shadows, look, to be honest, you probably don't do this on a normal shot either. Well, you might, you might want to bring up some light in the foreground, that's looking pretty good. Stars are looking pretty ordinary though, aren't they? So let's have a play. Generally, just play with the sliders. I know that I want those stars to be more prominent. So let's see what's going to do that. I've had success by moving the white slider before. Ah, stars up, but look what happened to the foreground. Not so good. Okay, so instead of doing global adjustments, let's click on the graduated filter adjustment here. Once we click on there, we can Basically what this does, let me just show you. Let me, let's do something so we can see what's happening. Can we, let's turn that up, okay. Let's turn a few settings up. Okay, so you can see I've clicked and held and then let go and it's created this little neutral density filter, graduated filter effect and it's applying in that brightness. This is not the effect that I want, mind you. But you can see as I widen up the gap between the first and the last bracket here, it softens the transition. You can see I can get a very hard transition or a really nice soft transition like so. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's what we're aiming for here because we want to lift the, elevate the stars without blowing out all of this area. So let's see if we can do that. Reset. Let's start again. Reset. Oh. Back in here, I'm going to click the effect, the word effect here. That just resets all my sliders because you could see maybe the shadows were up. I don't want those shadows up. Just click on the effect. Is it one click or two? Two. Two clicks there. Oh, Anthony says focus peaking works a treat with astro focusing for those that have focus peaking on your cameras. Yeah, absolutely. Look, for the first time, I wouldn't rely on it, to be honest. My advice would be set your focus up in the daytime before you go out, um, but use peaking in case you get stuck and it's not working or et cetera, et cetera. But other than that, set it up in the daytime, put a little dot on your lens, you know, we're probably going to keep these lenses for a lifetime. The lenses I have are 10, 15 years old. Oh. 
sitting on my foot and it's gone to sleep. Um, so putting a small dot on there, you know, you're probably not going to resell the lens anyway, so it's no big deal, at least in my opinion. Okay, we've got the graduated filter. What we're going to do, is I'm going to create a grad in this area, sort of transition through here. And I do, I want to lift the whites up, I think. You can see it's not doing a lot, see that? But anything is better than nothing, isn't it? What if we play with contrast? Yeah, same, anything's better than nothing. What about clarity? Ta-da! Wow, didn't that make a huge difference? Okay. All right, we're getting there, okay. We've got a good base to work with now. Let's click close there. That's looking pretty good. Nice amount of stars now. And um, we've got that foreground nicely lit. We've controlled the fire. Looking pretty good, looking pretty good. Again, have a play with your, your own astro photos and see if those things work. Um, clarity, white point, lower the contrast maybe a little bit um, to help bring those stars out or maybe increasing the contrast might help as well. That, I mean, naturally I would expect increasing the contrast would work better than decreasing the contrast because it should um, brighten the bright points and darken the dark points. But uh, maybe in the case of some of the smaller stars, increasing the contrast might push them back away. Okay, what we're going to do, look, that's, that's a pretty noisy photo, right? And there's probably, look, there's probably nothing much we can do about it, really. And what you don't want to do, like you don't want to completely obliterate the noise like this, okay? This is a rookie error and something that I would have done five or 10 years ago was go, oh, let's obliterate the noise, both color noise and luminance. You know, and we end up, let's take it to the, right to the, that sort of degree. And look what happens to my face. It becomes like a cartoon, like a really kind of like painterly. Now you might like that effect, absolutely. You might enjoy that effect, but you know, for me, not so much on this one. So what we want to do is reduce the noise without creating any weird effects in the uh, subject in the foreground. So you can see what I can do is I move the detail slider all the way to 100. And what that does, the way noise works in Lightroom or in Photoshop as well, is if you imagine a grid, like a Rubik's cube of nine different colors or nine different luminosities. Okay, we'll talk about luminosity noise first. Luminance noise is a variation in the brightness of a pixel where it should be all consistent, um, grays and blacks in this case, in the sky, greys and blacks. So imagine a Rubik's cube with all different brightness pixels. What noise reduction does is it looks at all nine pixels, takes the average, and then replaces the middle pixel with the average of all nine. Okay, and that works incredibly well in uh, most circumstances, except in high detail, because you can see here, you know, on the hair on my face or some of the finer details, that's, it's, it, we don't want to replace my eyelashes by pixels from my eyelid, for example. So by turning the detail slider all the way to 100, it says, basically says to Lightroom, when there's a huge variation in the pixel luminance, like a really big variation, when there's detail edges, leave them alone. Just leave the details alone. And you can see it does an incredible job. Look at that, look at that. Let's go before, before, after. Really, really nice. Really nice. This is zoomed in at 100%. I'm probably never going to print this at one meter tall and, you know, whatever wide. It's, it's just really, really nice. And you, look, we could even lower the luminance noise down a fraction just to get a really natural kind of look there. And that's looking really good. Same with color. Color noise, much like luminance noise, it's a variation in the color from pixel to pixel. So you might see some weird greens and magentas. Let's have a look and see if any are there. Let's turn that right down. Let's turn that right down. Let's go up to the sky. Oh, it's having trouble. Okay, here we go. Can you see all those green and magenta dots in the sky? That's color noise. Let's try and remove the majority of that color noise. 
Hey, look at that, look at that, perfect. It does it the same way. It takes the average, replaces the center pixel with the average, or at least that's my understanding of it. So what I'm doing now is I'm just moving the color noise down until it's an, at an acceptable level, and then I'll turn the detail up. Does it bring any back? No, it's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay, that's all we need to do. Sharpening, I normally have my radius all the way to the left, my detail all the way to the right, my amount, mm, 30-ish, okay. Let's zoom in where it really matters. Yeah, a little bit of sharpening, a little bit, not too much, maybe 25, okay. And then we can mask it out as well. Let's zoom back, see what masking does. If we hold down the Alt or Option button and then click on the masking slider, where it's white is where the sharpening will be applied, where it's black it won't be. So I really just want the sharpening in those critical areas of the subject, something like that. Perfect. Lightroom edit, pretty much done. What if we add a little bit more clarity? Zoom in, making sure I'm not doing anything terrible. That looks pretty good. My face is a little bit more underexposed, so the quality of the file or the pixels just here is not as good as the other one. As my wife, I mean, but she's the pretty one, so we, we, we need her to be, uh, you know, the best within the frame. Peter Hammer says the new something or other, OMD Mark III, has astrofocus, perfect, absolutely. There's some dedicated cameras that have some specific features that are very good for astrofocusing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but as you can imagine, I'm sort of trying to make this all inclusive for everyone that doesn't have those specific features. But if you have them, then try them. But I would still, I would still focus and get to understand your camera during the day before you go out there, just in case it presents issues when you're in the field. Brian says you can stack several photos. Absolutely, you can stack several photos to remove noise as well. Um, I will go into that if I create this astro, how to process, capture, etc., etc. Astro images, I will show you how to stack to get incredible quality skies in your astro images. Okay, I think we're ready to go to Photoshop. Right click, edit in. Photoshop, you'll see I'm using Photoshop 2019. My Windows machine over there. I think that was the button I'm supposed to tick. My Windows machine over there is completely up to date. My Mac has reached its threshold and is no longer allowing me to update beyond 2019 Photoshop version, but it is, perfect, it is, the easiest for me to stream live to YouTube on this particular unit rather than the Windows. So when I do do, if I do, make the Astro, um, mini Astro course, I'll do it on the Windows machine so we're all up to date on the latest version. Okay. Now, like we do with most of our processing, you know, this is the area. This is the important area. In fact, you can see a little bit of coma. Whoops. This is probably coma. That's what happens if you have an, a lens, and it's partly because this is, uh, this is not focused on the stars properly. As I said, it's focused on the family in the foreground, but essentially this is what happens. Forms these little angel type um, shapes from the stars. This lens is very, very good at not doing that when it's correctly focused at infinity. Now this was correctly focused, as I said, to capture the family in full frame, so I had to sacrifice a little bit for the stars and you can see it's you can see it's better in the center of the frame and worse as we get to the outside which is kind of typical of most lenses when they're wide open Malin says does the grad filter work from the center of the image in no not that I know of. I'm not sure about that, Malin. I'm not sure. As in having most of the effect in the middle and then feathering out top and bottom, 
I don't know. I'm not sure about that one. Um, Google will have the answer though. Okay. Let's have a look what we're going to do in Photoshop here. I'll zoom in a little bit. I can see there's some issues like, you know, dust removal would be next, but I think the, the dust removal is pretty much okay on this lens, but there's a little bit of a shiny headlight or something or a torch lamp over in the tree there. So we might remove that. We'll add a blank layer. We'll add the, grab the spot healing tool. Bop, remove that. That looks good. Okay. Let's, get, let's just elevate the light a fraction here. Maybe I don't need more light, but we'll try. Let's just, I've added a curves layer. And again, if you're not comfortable in, you know, Photoshop and Lightroom and curves and adjustment layers and masks, do yourself a favor, jump down below, see my most popular Photoshop course down below, which is my beginner workflow. I'll explain layers, masks, and everything in detail, which will give you a great foundation to be able to follow along with some of these more technical, more advanced tutorials like this one. Just a little bit of light, just a little bit, a little bit more. You know, this is the area that I really want to shine. Command or Control I, B for brush, opacity at about 30%. Flow at about 50. How are we going for numbers? I can't see the numbers anymore. I sacked that part of the show. Um, how are we going for viewers? It doesn't really matter, does it? It should all be about the content I'm producing, but I'm interested um, in this particular one. All right. Brush down at 0% hardness there, making sure we have a white brush. And now with that white brush, Looks like a gas bottle. It is a gas bottle campfire. My dad made this for me. Uh, gas, you cut the top of a gas, look, don't do this at home because I'm sure it could be dangerous, you know, with gas and gas bottles and angle grinders and sparks. I don't recommend just grabbing any old gas bottle and chopping into it with an angle grinder. Who knows what could happen? Um, and I don't know the safety precautions, to be honest, to go about it safely, but that's exactly what it is. It's a gas bottle with a top cut off and then the top's been welded to the bottom as a stand. Fill it up with wood and it creates a beautiful little bucket of fire. And it's only, you know, only small. Okay, just a little bit more light here and here. A little bit more light there and there. 207 viewers, wow! You guys are going crazy this morning. It's great to have some big numbers again. YouTube was ignoring me last week and uh, we had a big drop off. But to crack 200 on a Monday, absolutely brilliant. Thanks everyone for watching along. Once again, if you're new, be sure to hit the subscribe button. We do this every day at the same time, 10 o'clock Sydney time in Australia. And if you are regular, thanks so much for joining us. You know, most days when you can, I love having you all here. And I love seeing the same names uh, day in, day out. Okay, we've just added a little bit little bit of light. Look, we could probably dull off some of the light in the foreground around here. And that tree, I think I want to dull that down too. Let's do that. I don't think it's part of the story, that tree. So let's push it into the background. We're going to darken down. When we darken for shadows, which is essentially what I want to do, I'm going to pull the white point down. You can also darken by pulling this point. In this case, either would work. They're both working pretty well. I prefer to darken down, well, I don't really prefer either way, to be honest. I use them um, both equally. Okay, Command or Control I, turn the mask to black. And let's just, let's zoom back a bit so I can see. Same brush, and we'll just push these trees and this light into the background a little bit. Okay, same on this side. You know, we might even, maybe not there, maybe there, Whoop, where's X? I lost X on the keyboard. Maybe there, maybe we could put a bit of fire glow around there. Okay. That tree, we might work on that tree a little bit more. In fact, it's causing issues in my sky, isn't it? We'll work on that separately. Okay, let's add another curves layer and do the same thing. And you'll find out why I want to do that separately now. Push that tree right back. Command or Control I. 
Why do we think we're doing this one separately? Because we want to use blend if, because blend if is the secret to everything, the solution to everything. Okay, that looks pretty good. It's not really the solution to everything, as you might know. But what it's going to let me do, I think, is pull, see that dark black patch in the sky behind the tree? Very, very ugly. Double click here to access Blend If. If you don't know what I'm talking about with Blend If, and you are relatively experienced in Photoshop, it's absolutely incredible. And there's a uh, tutorial, dedicated Blend If tutorial, in the best of videos in the links in the description of this video. There's links down there to the Blend If tutorial. So check that out. If you don't know what Blend If is, you absolutely need to know what Blend If is. But it's a more advanced tutorial, so if you don't know what layers and masks are, you should absolutely learn those first and get that foundation of Photoshop first. Description in the, in the, um, or link in the description for that Photoshop course as well, the beginner's workflow course. All we're going to do is see how I can pull that out of the sky like so. Ooh, is it going to let me? It might not. Oh, I just saw, I said blend if was the secret source to everything and it's... It's kind of making a mess of that tree, isn't it? It's not very nice. It has pulled that effect out of the sky reasonably well, but it's made the tree very, very flat. Let's see if we can... That's better. That's better. Okay. Let's do another layer. Again, sometimes it works perfectly. The joys of live is you get to see the reality of how I edit. And sometimes it takes a little bit, as you know, a little bit of to and fro to really get what you want. This time I'm going to paint a little more accurately. So I don't rely on blend if so much. Click, 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 click. We still will rely on Blend If a little bit, I think. Back into Blend If, see if we can pull that darkness out of the sky. Yes, we can. It's not too bad. Those two layers have gone from there to there, I would want to keep working on that to be honest, basically doing much the same. Just keep, you know, darkening, darkening down, darkening down in that area. I'll leave that as is for now and we'll keep working. I'll probably come back to it towards the end. 218 watching now, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. If it's the first time, be sure to hit the subscribe button. We do it every day. All right. Let's see if we can't lift up the stars a little bit. Let's, what, you know, curves. Let's play with curves first of all and see what we can do here. Um, if I grab the hand, you can see the dark sections of the night sky are very low on the histogram over here. You can see that point jumping up and down and you know the stars. So that's pretty much the night sky, that section there. So what if we... Too much, I think, yeah? Maybe too much. Let's go with that. The color of the sky is not real nice either, is it? It's kind of got a bit of reddy, magentary, and it's not, it's a burgundy color. It's not great. We will fix that up, particularly on the edges. You can still see a lot of color contaminating there. It's due to really pushing this file to its limits. Okay, that four second exposure is not enough to capture the night sky generally, but we will be able to get a reasonable result out of it, I think. Command or Control I to invert, B for brush. We'll get a bigger brush here. We'll paint that in. I don't want the stars to be hectically over the top, if you know what I mean. I do want it to be about the family and the connection of the family and the campfire, as you know, with the stars just adding the icing on top of the cake, so I don't want them to be too crazy. Let's go ahead and try and remove that color cast. I need to merge all my layers together because I'm going to do a little bit of a, a color blur, which will make 
see that section is really annoying me. That magenta section in the middle, it, it's probably, I'm not sure, but I think it's probably like a, a reflection of the fire, maybe in the lens hood or inside the lens itself, which is bouncing up into the sky. At least that's what I think it is, because that's, I don't, I've never seen that central magenta -y red color in an astro photo of mine before. I'm guessing it's the sky, I mean the, the fire reflecting into the lens in some manner. So merging all those layers together on, on my Mac here, Command, Alt, Shift, E for everything. You can see that creates a layer that is the combination of all the layers below. On your PC that will be Control, Option, Shift and then press E for everything. Hold down those buttons and press E for everything. And I'm going to change the blend mode just above the layer there, it says normal, change that to color. So now the only information that this layer is passing on is its color information, not its brightness information if you like, not its tonal information. And if I blur that now, it will hopefully take care of that magenta issue. Blur, Gaussian blur, Gaussian blur, <laughs> I don't know how to say that word. Look at that. Look, the color is not nice. Okay, look, look what it's done down here, giving us a sepia tone look. But what I'm looking at here is that reddish section. We're trying to blur that out of the image. Okay, and we've done that. I had to blur it a lot to get it, but now we have a consistent color palette, even though it still is the wrong color palette across the image, but that's okay. Click, or, click okay. Perfect. We'll add a layer mask down here, the little rectangle with a circle in it. Again, all explained in detail in my courses and you can, be, you can rest assured in my courses, I go about the tutorials much, much more deliberately and slower. But, you know, for the sake of YouTube and entertainment, I need to go a little bit faster. What I'm doing now is I'm just going to paint this effect into the sky with a 100% brush like so. See how that's consistent now, but it's not nice. A couple of questions. Peter Hammer says luminosity masking would be better than blend if here. Um, absolutely not true in my opinion. For the main reason, Peter, and I'm not having a go at luminosity masks, but for the main reason that blend if has absolutely infinite results in what I can do as far as the masking and the feather. Um, so I am of the belief that uh, Blend If can do absolutely everything that Luminosity can do. Um, I could be wrong though, Peter, absolutely. You're more of an expert than I am, but it is my opinion that you know we can feather that as much as we like. We can select the exact pixels that we want to leave in and leave out. Maybe, and this is probably where you're correct, Maybe you can intersect two different luminosity masks to remove that area. Let me know if that's what you're thinking. And on that level, I wasn't thinking that in the beginning. On that level, you're probably right. Absolutely. There's always a million different ways to get around these things. Luminosity masks are excellent. Um, I've never learned them. There's a huge learning curve and a huge investment to do so. So absolutely, Peter. Yeah, uh, Brian says he thinks the, the star chroma aberration in the top left is a um, large mag, Magellanic, I can't pronounce that. We'll get Andy's Astro to do that. In fact, Andy's Astro will be the one to tell us if he's still there, if that's indeed what that is. I don't think it is, to be honest. Um, I don't think it is. I've seen that, that large, however you say it, magalitic cloud. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've seen that before, and um, it's a it's much bigger and softer than what that is. That definitely looks like some form of aberration of a large star to me. But I could be wrong again. Absolutely, I could be wrong. And Andrew, uh, uh, the astro experts out there, will tell me um, if that's the location of where that normally is above the rising uh, Milky Way core. Then I stand corrected. But I don't think that's the actual location. Um, okay, let's keep moving. I want to now change the color tone of that sky. 
Okay, and we might also brighten it up and add some contrast into some areas, a little bit maybe. Let's add a color wash to the sky. Let's add a color wash to the sky. Blue or purple? Oh, hello. I wasn't expecting to do color dodge, but it looks quite quite nice in the sky. I was expecting to do a soft light, but we might use color dodge. There you go. I don't like that color too much, to be honest, though. Let's go and have oh, let's go and have a closer look. I do want a little bit of blue. Maybe, no, not purple, blue. Yeah, yeah, I'm not convinced yet. Yeah, well, actually, maybe. I like the coldness of that night sky. Okay, let's go with that. But I don't really want the stars to be in there all that much. So let's pull them out with blend if. Okay, so they're not as contaminated as the rest of the image is. Something like that. Okay. Now, I'm going to use that mask. I'm not going to invert it, and I'm going to paint it away with a black brush. Oop, that's a really intense black brush. Let's drop that down 30%, 50%. And I just, because I want the warmth of the fire here, but surrounded by, you know, a cold night scene, if you like. Still not 100% convinced of that color in the sky. We'll keep working on that as we go. A couple of other questions here. Peter says, you can absolutely get luminosity masking in five minutes. Not for me, mate, unfortunately. I've tried it a couple of times and I just thought, wow, this is overly complex for the result that I'm getting or the additional... Yes, it is an incredible tool. I absolutely agree with you, but the addition that it gives my workflow and the complexity that I have to add and invest into that has never been worth it, to be honest. And, and that's all that it comes down to. And I don't, I will never ever teach anything that I don't use and believe in myself. Well, no, believe in is the wrong word because I do believe in luminosity. It's great, but I don't find any need for it. It would be one in a hundred. And maybe this is a case where I could use luminosity to make it easier, but what it's going to save me is about 30 seconds on one in a hundred images where I could just zoom into that little section and paint it out because Blendif is not doing the exact right job. So absolutely, everyone's got a different tool set. My particular tool set doesn't include luminosity masks, it includes Blendif. Um, and the reason behind that is, is I've never seen a, a need to use Blendif and I feel like it's uh, rather complex to learn, but you have a different opinion, mate, and, and absolutely I respect that. And, and you enjoy luminosity masks? Um, go for it, absolutely. All right, we're getting there, aren't we? We're getting there. Can we add a dark purple to the sky? You are hearing me, you're hearing me. You know I love dark purple in my night skies and my sunrise sunsets. We are going to do a little bit of that. What I'm going to do first is add a little bit of fire glow. Let's do that, solid color layer. I love, I love these hazy glow layers and you'll, you'll know that by probably watching previous tutorials. I'm just going to choose an orange color, a bit of a guess to begin with. Lower the opacity down and you'll see this sort of haziness. Let's double click back in. It needs to be brighter. Yeah. Yeah. I'm feeling that could work. Let's see. Click on the mask, command or control, invert. The one thing about Photoshop, um, it, we're having this bit of a debate to and fro between Peter and myself about luminosity masking and the value of luminosity. Trust me, I know it's an incredible tool, but what I will say, one thing about if you're wanting to create incredible, you know, st stories and images with narrative and emotion and feeling um, and all that good stuff that you see from the images that you want to create on Instagram and and uh, maybe some of your idols, maybe you love romantic paintings like I do. Maybe you have um, particular photographers that you idolize and wish you could create incredible, moving, emotional, meaningful, purposeful images like they do. 
I would say absolutely, once you have a basic understanding of Photoshop, layers, masks, etc., etc., just a basic understanding, you need to start balancing out that basic understanding, not with more technical Photoshop, not with more technical, because I've seen a lot of people, a lot of technical people, um, go down that path of learning every single trick and technique in Photoshop, but what they've forgotten to learn is the basic understanding of how to use those techniques to create meaning and create story and create feeling, okay, and place light and the importance of light versus the importance of shadow and how contrast can make us feel and how colors can make us feel. So you need to balance it with the theory of image making because Photoshop alone is not going to allow you to create breathtaking, powerful, emotive photographs. You might stumble across a particular formula, you know, on the odd occasion, but what you need is to balance the learning the technical with, of Photoshop with learning the technical aspects of image making, the importance of color, color combination, color theory, uh, what, how contrast can affect our moods, both low and high contrast, and how bright images affect us differently from dark images, and how to apply those basic light and dark techniques into a photograph to create these images that we're looking for. So specifically just focusing on one area of the technicalities of Photoshop, and I'm not picking on luminosity masking, absolutely, once you elevate both of those areas to a point and you feel like you're still missing something, then invest in luminosity masking. But I wouldn't, if it was me advising my own self, I wouldn't go and and I never did, to be honest, I wouldn't go and invest all my energy in the technical aspects of Photoshop and leaving myself with a deficiency in the understanding of image creation and the use of light and the use of even things like composition. Okay, we need to balance those. So that's how you'll get the best out of your images in the most efficient way, is to bring up all the areas or bring up your weak points. Okay, it's no good having, you know, a doctorate in Photoshop if you don't understand some of the other weaker points of your photography skill set, okay? And uh, in this case, it can be just the placement of light and different things. Look how we've got these beautiful complementary colors working here, for example, the warm color versus the cold, creating a, a really atmospheric feeling to this. And now we're going to place a bit of a fire glow and let's see how that works. Uh, where are we, white brush? Look at that. Maybe that's a bit too much. A little bit too much, okay? Maybe just around the fire here, we could do a little bit more. Make it rather intense here. And just push that with a black brush. Take a little bit out of there, a little bit out of there. And maybe it's a bit too much around that fire too. I was using a white brush. I kept painting it on, didn't I? It's supposed to be a black brush. There we go, just take a little bit away from that area, a little bit away from there, a little bit away from there. Let's have a look. Probably a bit too much. Let's just lower the opacity now that I turn that on and off. Beautiful, let's work on the sky a little bit more. We're nearly there, we're nearly there, let's have a look. Yeah, remember we came all the way from, of course, here. We came all the way from there as the raw file. In fact, that's not even the raw file. Let's reset the raw file. Is that the raw file? Is it resetting? Oh, basic. Looks a bit, um, it looks, let's go back to the library. Yeah, apparently it is the raw file. It doesn't look, it looks like it's got a little bit more life. It absolutely has more life. Why aren't you resetting? I don't, oh, I have a copy. Do we have a virtual copy? Something going on here. Reset. There we go. The joys of live YouTube. Hey, I can feel the, the blood pressure rising and uh, my face is probably going red. It's probably pink. Um, anyway, that was the raw file. That's what I was trying to search for to show you. And if we go back to Photoshop, look, we're really, we're getting there, aren't we? We're getting there. I think this area could be a little bit warmer now that I flick between the two and that's really important to flick or go and have a cup of tea and come back. I want that to be warmer. I also want to play around with the sky a little bit. It's a little bit too blue in some areas. I'm going to use, what am I going to use? 
Color balance? Where are you, color balance? I can't find you. There you are. Color balance. All right. We're going to add a little bit of warmth. Just a little bit. Right. Don't need much. And again, I'm going to invert that layer, B for brush. And at the end of the day, don't worry too much about me and my luminosity mask versus blend if, um, or really anything that I say. If you don't agree with it, it's it's fine. You know, we all have we all have different opinions, and we're all you know open to different ways of learning. Um, I don't want that warmth leaking up into the sky there. Is that leaking up too? A little bit. Just with my black brush, just cleaning up that section there a little bit. Okay. Yeah, Peter says, absolutely, there's more than one way to get everywhere, 100%. That's why Photoshop is not the most important, or it's one of the most important tools, but that knowledge of how to use light, contrast, and color to create what you want to create is probably more significant than the learning of Photoshop. But within our photography timeline, we learn our camera first, and then we start learning elements of composition, and then we start getting into Lightroom maybe, and then Photoshop. There's sort of a natural progression there, but what I'm saying is don't get too focused on you know, that one area of the technicality of Photoshop because there's another area of learning where to place the light, et cetera, et cetera, to really get those images that you want. Graham says, someone said recently, when you start spending all your time self-critiquing, it's time to pause and learn, pause the learning and focus on taking great images. Focus on capturing moments, absolutely. Let's work on the sky, and then I think we're nearly done. I think we're nearly there. I think I want to, I want to take a little bit of the purple out of the middle. I want it to sort of be blue, maybe drifting to purple, I think. I'll just pull all the saturation down. Command or Control I to invert. Nice big brush. Okay, and now I feel like a photo filter. Just play around. There's different ways of colors even. Solid color I use a lot. Color balance I often use, I've used already. You could use hue saturation and you can use photo filters. There's probably others as well. I'm going to use photo filters in the cool filter and look for that night sky feeling, something that resonates with me. That's too much for me. That's quite nice. We'll go that middle one. Yep, again, I want to use my black brush to just keep the warmth in this section because it's going to make the, the image really, really interesting by having those complementary colors. What are you doing to me? Okay, that shouldn't be purple down there either. That should be more orangish red. Is that blue going down there? Yes, it is. Let's come back to this layer and take that blue out of that corner as well. Also take it out of there. So the foreground is rather warm. Look at that. Look at that. Really, really nice. Beautiful. Okay, a little bit of purple. A little bit of purple. Let's see if it works. I'm not 100% happy with the stars, to be honest. How did the other layer look, the other finished? Yeah, it was a bit more subtle, wasn't it? I tend to go overboard on these early morning live session edits, don't I? It's just the way I edit. I tend to go overboard, then pull back. In fact, I'll show you this morning one way you can pull back uh, really, really easily. Let's add a little bit of purple, solid color. Purple, maybe something like that. This will be too much to begin with. Soft light. What's color dodge look like? Woo, color dodge, way over the top. Let's go soft light. Now, Andy, the astrophotographers will be having a heart attack at me butchering this image. Um, absolutely. But you don't have to go overboard with these different colorizations, etc., etc. Click OK. Got a funny feeling this could be the video that has the most dislikes. It might also get the most likes. 
fire them up. If you're enjoying the video, if you find it at least entertaining, um, then please, I would love you to put a little like there for me. Let's just put a little bit of purple, sort of drifting into a purplish night sky up the top. It's too dark up the top too for mine. Yeah, that's probably all I want to be honest. It might even be a bit much. Let's just push that back. Just picking up the purple, but I also want to pick up that black. I don't want it to be so black. Curves. Command or Control I. I'll zoom back a bit. B for brush. All right, I think you get the idea. I think you get the idea. I mean, let's have a look at before and after since we came from Lightroom before. Yeah, nice. You know, we got the stars, but the color's a bit wrong. It's a bit burnt. It's a bit, when I say burnt, it's a bit of a burntish color, orangish, you know, from artificial lights. I did see that someone asked, where was that light coming from? It's coming from the other caravans. I turned all my caravan lights off, um, but there's other people with caravans and campfires around that's coming across the foreground and it actually works quite well. And we managed to give it some color, give it some life, you know, and really capture the feeling of, I guess, you know, that softness of, of um, love and uh, these sort of things of a family spending this incredible night around the fire. Before, after, before, after. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. It's a little bit, it's still a bit cold in the foreground for mine. Let's, Let's have a, a couple more little layers here and see if we can't just get a little bit more warmth with a photo filter, maybe in the foreground, the lower section. It's very little between those, isn't there? Almost nothing. Let's turn that up. Yeah, I'm not convinced. Let's just invert that and paint a little bit of that. 231, we're approaching record territory. It's incredible, guys. If you're new to the stream and you're enjoying this, look, I know it's not for everyone the way that I tend to go overboard and butcher the photos, but you can take little snippets of these Photoshop techniques and apply it to any image in your own particular style. If you, enjoy, if you enjoyed what you've seen of today, if maybe you've come in late, then the replay will be over on my YouTube channel in a matter of 10 or 15 minutes when we wrap this up. And of course, hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell and join us again tomorrow. We're going to have more fun in Photoshop or with photography tomorrow. And of course, Thursday, we've got Paul Holan presenting an adventure photography body of work on the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon in the United States of America, absolutely brilliant. He's going to transport us, take us on a virtual trip, rapiding, whitewater rafting down the Grand Canyon. Can't wait. That's going to be absolutely epic. Look, I think we managed to give this some justice. It's not perfect. I'd keep tweaking this. My words aren't coming out properly, are they? <laughs> I'd keep tweaking this. I would uh, go and have a cup of tea, come back. You know, the sky is not perfect. It's got a real, real blue tone, which I quite like, but it's a little bit over the top. Um, I'd separate that out a little bit, maybe add some warmth to the Milky Way core or something like that. Merging layers. What does Andrew ask about merging layers? I'm just trying to scan for that question. I can't see it. Oh, here we go. Oh, sorry, not Andrew, Anthony. Remerging layers, command, option, shift, plus E. Can you still make adjustments to the layers below? No, you can't, you cannot. Generally, I will make those merged up layers either at the very beginning of my workflow or at the very end of my workflow. The reason you need them is for any adjustment that requires filters, okay? Filters work on the pixels themselves. You can't apply them to a blank layer or anything like that as far as I'm aware. So generally I'll do that filter kind of adjustment, usually towards the end. In this case I did and I, well, did I do it at the start? I did it pretty close to the start, didn't I? Pretty close to the start. Um, or at the beginning of the workflow. I mean, the other thing we could do, let's do a, a merged up command. This is the end of the workflow command. Alt, Shift, E, or sorry, 
Command Option Shift D on a Mac or Control Alt Shift D on a PC, you can see that merged up layer. If we go to the filter menu, let's add a little bit more clarity. We might get some more pop from the stars. Filter menu, Camera Raw. This gives us access to the Lightroom filters where clarity is. And look, you might want to have a tweak with the colors. You know, you can do all sorts of things here. Basically allows you to use the Lightroom tools on a separate layer in Photoshop, which is really cool. I don't think I need any of it, to be honest. Adding more clarity looks worse, not better. So we'll just cancel that in this circumstance. Let me just have a quick scan for questions and then we'll wrap it up. But, uh, you know, hit the like button. Make sure that you join us again tomorrow. It's going to be really fun. I've got some good stuff tomorrow and the next day and Paul Holland on Thursday. Going to be absolutely incredible. Can't wait to get out in the outback when we're released. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Jane. Me too. I really miss the outback and I miss taking photos. I haven't been taking photos. I live in a spectacular location with lots of dramatic, romantic seascapes. And um, look, I probably could got away, gotten away with photographing whilst exercising or whatnot, but I haven't been. But I'm looking forward in the next couple of weeks to really getting out there and showing you some new work from, the, from my local, you know, from where I live. Yeah, so Rose, the reason we merge up is because we needed to use a filter menu, in that case blur, and the blur will only work on photographic pixels. So you can see as we look down the layers, the icons on the left of each layer, you can see we have the curves icon. It doesn't matter what the icon looks like, to be honest. Someone asked me that the other day. It's not always the same on different versions of Photoshop, but you can see here, or here particularly, we have a thumbnail that contains the actual photograph. And if we turn off all the layers below, it does nothing anymore. Okay, all turned off. As we turn them all back on. But if we were wanting to do a blur or anything in this filter menu here, let's go blur for example. Okay, we need We need the photographic pixels to blur them. Let's click OK. Maybe, maybe we can add like a soft glow light to the fire in soft light. Screen, you know, just experiment with these different things. Blur layers and check what the different blend modes do. You can see most of them are horrible. Absolutely. Soft light's not bad. It makes everything a little bit dark. So again, like I did before, that's an experiment that goes in the trash bin. Away you go. Okay. Why, curious why you reduce opacity as well as flow and not just reduce the flow to say on the brushes? Um, good question. Flow, look, to be honest, flow is a bit of a mystery. Uh, I've heard people explain flow as in the amount of paint you have on a brush, but essentially I've done a lot of research into what they, what they do I can't really figure out exactly what they do perfectly, technically, to be able to relate that to you. But what I did notice is with the flow at 50%, it gives a softer edge brush. Let me give you a quick, quick, quick demonstration on that. Very quick, let's go, let's open a new file. Very quick, and then we'll wrap it up. Thanks everyone for sticking around, click OK. Why do we use flow? The best way I can describe it. Okay, let's do a few examples here. Do, do, do. Let's do a few examples. That is 100% opacity, 100% flow, okay? If we lower the brush to 50% opacity and leave the flow at 100, in fact, what I'm going to do, make this a little bit wider, it will be more obvious. Yep, we should fit three lines in like that. 100% flow. 100% opacity, 50% opacity, 100% flow. Hopefully this is going to show up on the screen below. If not, try it at home and you should see what I'm talking about. Then when we drop the, uh, the uh, flow down, it's subtle, but there is a very significant advantage in my opinion. See how when we paint with 100% flow and 100% opacity. The edge of the brush is about, I would say about 
20 to 25 percent of the brush width and we're already up to hundred percent you know right here so the majority of the brush is painting at 100 percent rather harshly that's exactly the same although you can't really see it on the 50 percent layer here but when we go to flow when we put the flow at 50 percent it transitions it almost transitions so that it's just coming up you know, softening the brush. There's no real hard edge. Like, see that hard edge you can see here? That exists here as well, but doesn't exist when we drop the flow down. Okay, now there's no real significance most of the time to changing the flow from 50%, and the rest of the time I just use opacity to make the brush come on softer, which, which will basically just give us a softer tone of grey. Okay, so there's no Beyond lowering it to 50%, there is really no other advantage or not much advantage from messing about with the flow other than put it on 50% and leave it in my opinion. Let's just scan down here. I see a lot of names, a lot of names that are joining us. Torben says, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Torben. I, yeah. I think, where are you from mate? Norway, Iceland, something like that. Somewhere over far flung places of the world. What time of the day is it over there? He says, given the starting point, only four seconds exposure, you know, it turned out to be a pretty reasonable result. I agree, you know, that is absolutely printable at a nice size, A4, maybe even A3, maybe even A2, absolutely. Just wondering when your states will open up the border. Yeah, I'm not sure when, what's going on with that. Layer for blurring. So you can go back and adjust the blur. Oh, yeah, absolutely, Brian. You're a, a technical wizard. I get that from the, the, the tips that you're placing in there. Absolutely, in my courses, I talk about smart layers so you can adjust the blur, absolutely. I didn't do it then. I was in a, I didn't think about it, to be honest. Um, but yes, using smart layers. Uh, smart filters to allow you to adjust the blur at a later stage is a very, very good idea. Is there any difference between flow and fill? Flow and fill? Do we mean opacity and fill? Are we talking on the brush? Opacity and fill. Flow and fill? I'm not sure, to be honest. I don't, I don't use fill. And I've seen a few tutorials on exactly what fill does and it seems to work with blend modes quite well. But I'd be lying if I said I knew exactly what it did. I'll, I'll try and look that up and tell you in the coming weeks. Declan, see you tomorrow, mate. Thanks for tuning in. I know it's late over there. Get some sleep, brother. Sleep well. Torben said to call him T-Bear. All right, T-Bear. I can handle that. Probably me completely mispronouncing your name. So T-Bear works for me. I know how to pronounce that. Um, uh, what's the difference between fill and opacity? You got me there. I don't know, to be honest. I don't know. Opacity, I know what opacity is. It, it uh, decreases the intensity of whatever it is the opacity is relating to. So if you want 1% of that layer or of that brush or 100%, you can adjust the opacity in between. Fill, I'd be lying if I tried to make up um, what that did um, but if you google if you google that or youtube that you'll absolutely find it there's some other youtubers that use it i believe it's something to do or it works particularly well with blend modes and textures and those kind of things particularly feel otherwise um, i don't see a great deal of use for it whenever i've watched tutorials on that you're really keen raj to get that question across weren't you it's there about 15 times <laughs> that's okay uh, in future when you're asking questions, hit the at, the at button, Adam, then type Adam and you'll see my name pop up and it'll come up in fluorescent orange like you see some of the other people when they're asking questions. Thanks again, guys. Um, enjoyable. I had a lot of fun. We're going to do, I don't know what we're, exactly we're going to do tomorrow. I've got a list of, of different techniques and a lot of photographers that are joining us in the future. It will be me myself with um, the only photographer coming on this week being Paul Holland. I might bring on two guest photographers next week. Uh, we've definitely got Mika Boynton, incredible landscape and aerial photographer coming on Thursday week, Thursday next week. And I'll also try and bring on someone else, maybe Tuesday or Wednesday. We'll have two guest photographers next week to really mix it up. Thanks again for watching along. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the show or if you're a regular and you enjoy the show regularly. If you're brand new here, 
I would love it if you join us again tomorrow. The best way to do that is hit the subscribe button and hit the notifications bell so that YouTube tells you when you, we go live. If not, join us the same time tomorrow, 10 a.m. Sydney time. I look forward to seeing you all then. I hope you enjoy the new set. I could have switched back to my other camera for the final outro, couldn't I? But anyway, thanks for joining me. Stay safe, take care, love to your family. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye for now. Where are we?